There have been high levels of interest in Africa by the international business community in the last decade or so. Companies in a range of industries from consumer goods to financial services to technology have since expanded their African footprints. Today, however, many investors and business leaders are asking whether Africa's growth has run out of steam. Lower resource prices and higher levels of social political instability have taken their toll. Africa's real GDP grew at an average of 3.3% between 2010 and 2015, considerably slower than 5.4% from 2000 to 2010. Notice how I'm taking the period between 2000 and 2015 because it is during this period, especially between 2013 and 2015, that the business community really started asking whether Africa could sustain the growth Research conducted by the McKinsey Global Institute makes it clear that Africa faces a real economic headwinds, including declining investment and savings and rising government debt. Yes, the overall picture disguises stock divergence. Growth has slowed sharply amongst oil exporters and North African countries, um, especially between 2010 and 2015 when they were affected by the 2011 Arab Spring democracy movements. But during this period, the rest of Africa posted accelerating growth at an average annual rate of 4.4% from 2010 to 2015, compared with the 4.1% between 2000 and 2010. Welcome to the seventh episode of the Disrupted Journals podcast. I'm your host, Cliff Nemachena, and today I'll allow you to take a trip in my head where I've been thinking about the future of Africa, what the data is telling us, um, Despite, of course, the challenging economic situation, the uncertainty that we're facing uh, in the whole world today, uh, conflict in Eastern Europe, we're still going through the pandemic. But today, most of what I'll be talking about will be focused on the period between 2000 and 2015. Um, the research that my team has done, uh, looking at the continent as a whole and the industries that we think no, will offer a lot of white space going forward. The industries that will be the most profitable given the social political factors affecting African countries. This podcast is brought to you by Lunio, a tech enabled digital marketing solutions provider creating custom strategies for each of our clients based on their needs and goals. We keep the focus on the metrics that mean the most, like leads and revenue generated. We know that hitting these goals is what moves businesses forward, and we believe that our clients' success is the best measure of our own performance. Visit our website link in the podcast episode description. Now, the research that I talked about, conducted by the McKenzie Global Institute, uh, it points to robust long-term economic fundamentals. Uh, I personally think in an aging world, Africa is the advantage of a young and growing population and will soon have the fastest urbanization rate in the world. By 2034, the countries of Africa are expected to have a larger workforce than either China or India. And when you look at the period between 2010 to 2015, job creation, um, no, not 2010 to 2015 actually, the uh, period before the pandemic, Job creation was outpacing growth in the labor force and the accelerating technological change was was and is unlocking new opportunities for consumers and businesses. And Africa really still has abundant resources. All this means that the continent still offers promising opportunities for global investors and businesses. The interest that has been declining really isn't supposed to win. We look at the data which I will give to you. Spending by African consumers and businesses today totals $4 trillion. Household consumption is expected to grow at an average 3.8% a year to reach um, $2.1 trillion in 2025, fueled by both population growth and rising incomes. In East Africa alone, more than 6 million households are expected to enter the consumer class by 2025. Business spending is even greater and is expected to grow to around 3.5 trillion by 2025. All this is in US dollars. And research by my team here at Lunio 
also shines a spotlight on the businesses. Both global multinationals and Africa-based corporations um, that are best poised to serve these burgeoning markets. Africa has more large firms than is commonly assumed. Um, I know every time we have, we conduct uh, a survey uh, and ask the business audience audiences to guess, just guessing how many companies uh, they are in Africa that have revenues above a billion dollars. Um, their answers range always from or between 50 to 100, but the true number is somewhere closer to 400, with a combined annual income of $1.2 trillion a year. Across most sectors, these companies are growing faster and are more profitable than their global peers. Our database of large companies show that Africa is a more diversified corporate landscape than might have been expected. For instance, we find that only 30% of revenues are earned by companies that operate in the resources sector. Around two-fifths of the 400 companies are publicly listed, and just under 30% of them are multinational corporations. Yet we find that corporate Africa really needs to step up its performance to make the most of the continent's economic opportunities. When you look at... Um, just outside South Africa, where I'm currently in, the continent has only 60% of the number of large firms one would expect if it were on par with peer regions. And their average revenue is at around $2 billion a year, which is really less than half that of large firms in Brazil, India, Mexico, and Russia. Um, and no African-owned companies in the Fortune 500. Now, in order to unlock growth, companies should look for opportunities in the six sectors that we have identified as having white space. These sectors are wholesale and retail, food and agri-processing, healthcare, financial services, manufacturing and construction. In manufacturing in particular, we estimate that Africa could nearly double its output from $500 billion to around $930 billion in 2025. Three quarters of that potential could come from meeting domestic demand. When we look at Africa today, um, we import one third of the food and beverages and similar processed goods that we consume. And how to build profitable pan-African businesses, there are several key steps that companies should take when, um, when you look at or when you want to tip consumer markets. Um, companies should develop a detailed understanding of income, uh, income category, and geographic trends, including the very different growth and stability profiles of each African country. Um, and you know, thriving in business will require all these companies to offer products and develop sales forces able to target Africa's relatively fragmented uh, private sector. And we see a great example of this currently happening. Um, Fusit Mbekwa's My Growth Fund use a similar process when they raise funds outside Africa. Now, companies looking to grow across the continent should develop a strong position in their home market. Use that as a base for expanding into markets well beyond their immediate region. Um, adopt a long-term perspective. Invest in local talent, and this is really, really important. And companies should build the partnerships needed to sustain um, success over decades. Um, when we look at the best uh, performing multinationals um, in Africa, um, they've been patient and they've really built a wide footprint. Most have been in Africa for longer than 15 years and more than half, I think, are present in more than 10 countries. Um, the turbulence, both economic and political, in parts of Africa in recent years has been a shock, to say the least not factoring in the pandemic, um, which, of course, has really devastated many industries in the continent. But I do not think and I do not believe it has derailed Africa's growth story. No doubt there's much that governments must do to improve the fitness of Africa's economies, including accelerating infrastructure development and deepening regional integration creating tomorrow's talent and ensuring healthy urbanization. But the private sector's role is just as important. No doubt it 
really relies on the government playing its part. But large companies, both African-owned and global, must be front and center in the continent's march toward prosperity. I really tried to unpack a lot of information there as quickly as I could, but unfortunately we are at the end of today's episode. I hope you learned something, something new, I hope. This episode gets you excited for the future of Africa. If you're an investor, I hope it entices you to look more into how you can invest in Africa. There's a lot of potential. There is a lot of belief, especially on my part. Uh, I believe the future is too bright. You can't deny it. Uh, please reach out to me on Twitter using the hashtag The Disrupted Journals. You can visit the website. The link is there in the description. And let's have a conversation. Um, there is a form on the website you can use to suggest topics you want us to discuss going forward. And any other um, query or inquiry that you might have. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, cheers. Cheers.